Beats Radio, scientists interviewing scientists. Canada is a worldwide leader in science and innovation. However, our communities need to be more connected to current scientific research in order to drive the future of scientific innovation. What steps can we take to more actively engage and connect our community with scientists and vice versa? Innovation and discovery are at the core of the current efforts of our government, but science sometimes gets slightly complicated to understand. At Beats Radio, we will tackle this by having young scientists and early career researchers interviewing scientists and innovators. By dissecting science in simple terms, this will allow our community to better understand the importance of science for our country. Stay tuned for the launch of our first radio podcast streamed from an actual lab. I was born in 1976. I grew up here. This building is who I am. The patients, doctors, nurses, and staff, they truly are my family. Some thought I wouldn't make it, but great leaders fought for me. They believed that I could change Ottawa, Canada, even the world. And they were right. By the time I was 30, I'd saved thousands of lives, was recognized internationally, and had collaborated with over 40 countries. I've performed over 500 heart transplants, discovered the world's first genetic risk factor for heart disease, combined care, research, and education in one place, leading the way for innovation in heart disease throughout Canada and the world. I'm always thinking of the future and learning from the past. But through all this, I couldn't have done it, not without the people. The people here have taught me that through great loss can come great triumph, and that fear is never as strong as hope. I can't stop until there's a cure, and I will spend every second of my life trying to save yours. Some might say I've lived a thousand lives, but I feel I'm just getting started. This is quite a day, quite a day for healthcare in Ottawa. Doctors, nurses, volunteers, board members. It takes a community to build a place like this. We will be able to perform more procedures reducing weightless in open heart surgery as well as in non-surgical procedures. The total of complex surgical and non-surgical interventions here will be over 12,000 a year. Welcome to our home and your home from the bottom of our heart. Thank you very much. I think it's enlightened. It's an amazing. Out of this world. <laughs> Magnificent. Beautiful. Incredible. Uh, amazing. Yeah. It's like going to the Star Trek age because the technology here and all this is compared to before. So imagine how patients are going to feel when they're being treated here. Uh, we're very pleased to have this new facility. It's going to be in a tremendous improvement for our patients. Uh, currently, they're in an area that's quite crowded. Uh, there's not a lot of space for their families when they come to visit. And uh, it's, certainly, uh, it's certainly older. So now we're in this bright new facility. There's all sorts of space for them. Um, and the places for families, there's a terrace for, pa for patients who have to stay a long time. So it's going to be a huge improvement um, for the staff, but more importantly for all of the patients. There's air everywhere, so there's nothing, uh, and that's very important in windows because people in after surgery 
they get disoriented if they can't see outside. So there, there's windows in every place and that's very, very important. This is uh, a moment we are waiting for the last 12 years. I mean, this is a brand new uh, facility which is adjacent to our current facility that, uh, that will uh, include all the uh, operating rooms, the, uh, the uh, intensive care beds, and uh, which is serving 80% of our patients because most of the things we do at the Heart Institute is uh, very advanced cardiovascular care with open heart surgery, with uh, high-tech uh, high uh, medicine. My name is Dr. Emilio Alcom. I'm a principal investigator and a laboratory director at University of Ottawa Heart Institute. In my laboratory, we use nanotechnology as a building block technique for improving the properties of materials for cardiac tissue repair, like, for example, elasticity or electroconductivity. We work every day for developing these new materials that will be tomorrow's a next generation of therapies and therapeutics in cardiac tissue repair in Canada and around the world. Uh, through the efforts of my team, we work every day for meeting the needs of tomorrow's Canada's healthcare system. Uh, for benefiting thousands of Canadians every day. My name is Dr. Eric Saronin and I'm a scientist and associate professor working here uh, in the Division of Cardiac Surgery at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute. In my lab, we're developing biomaterials and regenerative therapies to treat heart disease. One of the uh, materials that we use is made of a protein called collagen, which is d uh, damaged after a heart attack. We also study how our materials interact with the cells in the heart in order to develop, use this information to develop uh, better therapies down the road. Our hope is that we'll be able to uh, transplant our materials into patients who have suffered a heart attack to repair the damage that has occurred or even to limit the amount of damage that occurs in the first place. This would lead to a quality of life improvement for patients who have suffered a heart attack and also reduce the incidence of heart failure. Beats Radio, scientists interviewing scientists. Canada is a worldwide leader in science and innovation. However, our communities need to be more connected to current scientific research in order to drive the future of scientific innovation. So what steps can we take to more actively engage and connect our community with scientists and vice versa? Innovation and discovery are at the core of the current efforts of our government, but science sometimes gets slightly complicated to understand. At Beats Radio, we will tackle this by having young scientists and early career researchers interviewing scientists and innovators. By dissecting science in simple terms, this will allow our community to better understand the importance of science for our country. Stay tuned for the launch of our first radio podcast streamed from an actual lab. Beats Radio, scientists interviewing And why are you listening to us? Well, here at Beats Research Radio, we are here to communicate scientific research that is being conducted here in labs like this one behind me. And we're here to tell you how we get from a scientific concept to a product and how does that even make its way into uh, a clinic. So what we're trying to do is connect uh, people in the community to what we're trying to do here in the lab. 
And a unique thing that we're doing here today is that we have early career uh, scientists and researchers, such as myself, interviewing other scientists, which is something that um, other podcasts have never done before. So we're excited to have uh, you guys, our listeners, here to hear us talk about uh, the science and uh, what's going on here at the Heart Institute. So um, for our first guest here today, we have Dr. Uh, Emilio Alarcon, and he is a researcher uh, at Ottawa's Heart Institute uh, in the Division of Cardiac Surgery. Uh, and he is a researcher as well with the Bioengineering and Therapeutic Solutions Laboratory. So without any further ado, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Alarcon, who is sitting here with me today. So good morning, Dr. Alarcon. How is everything going with you today? Uh, so far so good. So it's the first streaming and we're really excited about this. And, um, uh, I would like to actually extend my gratitude to the Ottawa chapter, the biomaterials students, and to you for being actually uh, kindly enough of agreeing to, to be part of this, and also Alex, who is in the control today. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, yes, yeah, so before we get started, I'd like to thank everyone who got us here uh, to streaming today. So we have, um, of course, the University of Ottawa Heart Institute. Uh, we also have the Ottawa Biomaterials student chapter. Uh, and as well, we have eLife uh, and the BEATS uh, research team. So Dr. Alarcon, how, um, tell us a little bit about your background and how you sort of became a scientist, how you found <laughs> yourself sitting here today uh, in your lab at the Heart Institute. Well, it's, it's a long story, you know. I, I'm originally from Chile. Um, I was trained and, you know, I educated in there. I'm, I'm a chemist. Uh, my, my background is kind of a, a special breed, I would say, because I was trained as a physical organic chemist. So uh, I'm, I'm a person who knows how to do molecular kinetic models and stuff like that. And uh, almost 11 years ago, I came here with my wife for a postdoc. And um, we really like Canada, of course, and uh, we decided to stay. And uh, I'm here. I was recruited in 2003. 14 uh, to become actually a PI and, and working on, on, on transnational medicine. So uh, I had to do the transition from being a fundamental scientist all the way to become a, a, you know, someone able to, to translate technologies to the clinic. And uh, in the way of doing that, I realized that uh, one person with one only f f ex field of expertise is not able to do it. So here at the Heart Institute, we're really good at you know, creating these you know, interdisciplinary collaborative environments. So we can do a stuff that uh, otherwise, all by yourself, you cannot do it. And uh, I like to, to tell my students that, you know, we're stronger when we work together. And uh, when we, you work uh, in an institution like the Heart Institute, you really learn to, to, to value science because the science we do it is not for us. The science, the science we're doing is, is for the community, for helping patients in the future and helping clinicians to actually uh, produce better therapies and, and, and technologies for helping patients. Yeah, yes, so these interdisciplinary collaborations that you're talking about, um, what sort of collaborations are we talking about here? So are we talking about um, clinicians and scientists, or are there more people involved? Um, so when, when you create this inter interdisciplinary environment that is really you know, hot these days in, in Canada, you have to think that, the, for example, a chemist, I, I see is the material from a chemical point of view, but uh, for mm. really assembling the materials, you will need an engineer working with you. You will need a biologist to understand how actually cells interact with this. You will need a physiologist to tell you, like, you know, what's going to happen actually in, in the real, in the body. You will need people with expertise in the inflammation, people with expertise in, you know, clinical translation. Uh, it's so simple that uh, m myself as a chemist, I can I might have an idea on excellent material, but when I'm telling a, a physician, a surgeon that, you know, this is the material you have to use in the patient, it will be the, the one telling me that that is doable or not. So when you have that early intervention, I call it, much earlier, that in the later stage of your development, you are truly, uh, you know, adding a, a new value to the technology, to the material. So instead of uh, waiting five years for the clinician to look at your material and tell you, like, it's not going to work, you can actually do it at the very early stage, one, mm -hmm. two months into the development, and that will save you five years, and down the road it will save a lot of money and optimize the resources for the country. Right, that's so those collaborations are very important, and that's great that you're fostering those because it's important to work together and, you know, 
bring up solutions and you know talk with other people and you can get a better solution at the end of the day. So this idea of Beats Radio, what, how did it kind of come up uh, in your mind, the whole idea of creating a talk uh, radio for research and scientific research here in the lab? Um, in, in, in Canada, we do things extraordinarily well. I, I won't disagree on that. But uh, there is a disconnection between the community hmm. and, and scientists. And I think that an easy way to, to really put them together is for the community to understand that, you know, for example, here at the Harry Institute, but it, it, it can be actually extrapolated for Carleton University, for University of Ottawa, for different centers that we have in here, in institutions, and that the research we're doing is not for us. The research we're doing is for the community and with the community. And that speaks not only for applied scientists, or fundamental, but also for fundamental scientists as well. Right. So it's, it's as important that developing a material for cardiac tissue repair that someone else is understanding what is the role of, of certain enzyme that in the regulatory pathway of, of diabetes or something like that. So science has a value, and the value of science is creating and developing minds. And when you're developing the minds of the, of the youth, like you, you're truly creating this informed individual, someone that is able to, in the future, uh, use science for making decisions, and that is critical, you know, like uh, you, you've seen the, with, the, with all the climate change and everything. So governments need of scientists. So mm -hmm. scientists, they need to make themselves available to the community. Mm -hmm. And I think that Research Beats uh, Radio is going to be a great opportunity for, for actually scientists to come and talk to us and talk to the community. And, uh, I, you know, I think I had an idea and I had your support, guys, and here we are. <laughs> yeah. So what you're saying is it's important to, you know, have science be explained by scientists in clear and concise terms yes. so that we can get the community more involved in understanding how we actually um, bring something from the lab yes. into uh, into the clinics and where where we see them used every day in the hospital. So I think that's a great idea. Do you think that there was a, a moment or there was something that happened that kind of sparked your idea for this radio yes, show? Yes, so I'm, I'm dyslexic, so <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have I struggled all my life with expressing myself, okay? okay. So um, when I draw stuff, I put things in simple terms. I'm able to explain other people. And um, so the radio will actually help other people to really understand science and the way I do understand science. Because I can read books, but the way I understand is maybe different than you. Right. So the radio, I hope it will be an opportunity to not only to, to, to showcase science, which is really exciting science we have in the Ottawa Valley, uh, uh, but uh, to, to provide the community to get to know the scientists, to get to know the guy that is actually, we have many neighbors in here in Ruskin, for you asking around in this, this, this building that may, they might not know that in here we're doing good science. And, you know, sometimes we need your help and, and good ideas come from, from anywhere. So. Right, definitely. So in your opinion, what, uh, what are the, some of the tools that you think scientists need in order to better communicate the science that they're creating in the lab to people in the community? What do you think that, um, you know, we need there so that we can, you know, translate our ideas better? Um, so I, I like explaining science with daily life things, you know, like, uh, I don't know, like, for example, why do, you, do, do we need new material for cardiac tissue repair? And in a simple concept of you can actually picture heart as, uh, as like the muscle, the, the, all the proteins in there, all the, the, the components, mm -hmm. like a scaffold. Like, you know, you have these little houses in there. So they said what they're doing, they're living in there. And they do, they make the lives and they have the families. So mm -hmm. what happened with actually that scaffold is destroyed. So cells, they have to leave, they have to migrate, or, or they will simply die in actually in the, in the earthquake, I call it. Mm -hmm. the, the myocardial infarction. So concept like that. So I mean, scientists, first of all, they need to have a platform where they can freely share without feeling any compromise, just for the feeling of, of doing science mm -hmm. and actually sharing their science. They have to have the time, of course. And they have to have an audience willing to actually uh, listen to them and try to learn from them. Right. And uh, I always tell my colleagues that uh, the, the most fascinating things of teaching is that you are always learning. And uh, when you learn a new way of teaching something, you really learn the concept in a different way. Mm -hmm. If you, you cannot explain the concept, the science you're doing in simple concepts, well, maybe you have to revisit the way that actually you're doing the stuff. 
Right, definitely. Yeah, I think uh, that's a great, the little houses in the, in the <laughs> hearth, I think that's a great way of explaining for sure. Um, do you think there's, you know, a concept that you would, you know, you'd like our listeners to learn about today or, you know, maybe a fact, a fun fact that uh, somebody would find interesting? You know, like, uh, um, I wanted to become a chef because of becoming okay. a scientist, and, uh, but, but in Chile you cannot make a living out of that. Um, but, um, you know, chemistry and even making biomaterials, I feel like a little bit like the, the kitchen. You know, right. Because yeah. you go and, and mix it. So the thing is that we're doing now, we are in the lab, we are trying to create this, you know, uh, a, a really thick book of, of different recipes that to try to, to have them freely available for other research groups in, in Canada and around the world. And I think the most important message I would like to actually uh, leave it to our listeners is that science, we, in Canada we have a, the best example, I would say, around the world that is Sir Frederick Banting someone who is able to actually make a discovery out of curiosity, maybe out of, you know, just, just luck, as he said many mm -hmm. times. And he donated that for, to the community for one dollar, I guess, if I'm not mistaken. So living up to that example is, is something that uh, I myself find every day, that science is not for us, and science is for, for, for the community again. And when students are recruited at the high my lab, and here a bit uh, also, um, I, I tell them that, uh, I ask them what they did see when they came in, and they say, well, they, they, they saw actually the main floor. I say, what else did you see? And they look at me and say, what do you mean? You, you, you saw patients, you saw families, you mm -hmm. saw healthcare providers. So we are part of them. We are part of working every day for in the future to have normal technologies and normal therapies. So those families, they can eventually have the gift of life, of time. The only thing you cannot buy in this life is time. You mm -hmm. can buy anything else, but you cannot buy one second. Right. So I, I think as, uh, the message is that. So it, it, we have uh, not only by myself, speaking of myself, but uh, all many, many colleagues. Uh, we're working every day to try to actually make discoveries for helping patients and helping, you know, uh, uh, saving life, but also giving the gift of life of time to to others. So it's something that is quite important. Yeah, to definitely, us. creating those recipes to save the lives of those <laughs> walking in the door is uh, very, very, uh, you know, a, pa a passion, and that's just extremely a rewarding passion too. When you know you're able to translate what you are doing in the lab to what uh, you're seeing at the hospital. So. Very impressive. Um, so when you're not walking into the Heart Institute every day, every weekend, uh, what do you find yourself doing? What do you, um, you know, do for fun on, I guess, on the weekends? <laughs> so um, I'm a runner. I like running. So okay. and actually I had the opportunity early this year, uh, probably you saw the pictures at the very beginning, of assembling this uh, fundraising team for the Heart Institute uh, where I, I was able to engage a number of, of research teams mm -hmm. and uh, uh, other than running and uh, you know I, I did the half marathon in two hours and two minutes oh, <laughs> almost nice. under two hours uh, but uh, I didn't only by myself uh, you know we have a, a, a number of, 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 of my colleagues mm -hmm. and also the trainees because it's about building communities you know I always think about the scientific communities we're all a community and uh, the, the most benefit uh, I would say that is, uh, of course, uh, our society, but also trainees, because mm -hmm. uh, you know students are floating in different labs and they're learning from different backgrounds, and and also photographer. Actually, I must say myself, I'm not oh, as good as many of my actually friends, but uh, I like to do that. And mm -hmm. yeah, so it's I'm nice. a pretty simple. yeah. So you're building scientific communities, running communities. That's <laughs> awesome. Um, so for any young scientists that are listening right now or, you know, who want to break through into the research field or, you know, maybe want to, you know, come here to the Heart Institute and study with the new University of Ottawa Heart Institute, what do you, what would you say to them? How would you tell them to follow their passions? And You know, I, I think I would like to speak particularly to those that, who feel that they might not have what it takes to become a scientist. So. I'm a dyslexic, I always struggle with language, until I met this uh, good mentor, actually. And, uh, and he told me one sentence, he, he said like, you know what, we'll work on the language, but your science is fine. So you cannot fix the science, but you can fix the language. So I think it's extremely important, so like, uh, don't give up, and be curious. You have to always be curious. You cannot stop of, you know, appreciating the beauty of a, of a sunrise, of a sunset. Those are mm -hmm. marvelous, uh, actually, things that happen. All the, the Riley, the scattered and everything. And, and work hard. 
they have to work really hard and uh, because most of the science you might be gifted you might not uh, but uh, we scientists work really hard and uh, having a great team i think we are really fortunate at the university of ottawa and probably university of Ottawa in general uh, you know including all the institutes of having great students like you so i mean you you make the labs oh, that's great <laughs> Um, so in the lab, I guess, what's uh, maybe a project that you guys have ongoing or one that you uh, just published a paper or something that maybe our listeners would find uh, interesting, uh, something that you guys have done here recently? So we have been working for, for many years in a, in a new therapy for treating a cardio, car, a hearts after the cardio, myocardial infarction. And uh, the paper was recently accepted. It should be published in a couple of months or so. Um, but we were able to, to restore partially the, 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 the cardiac function. So Dr. Suronis, who is going to be the next guest, is going to explain more about this. But uh, the main problem we still have is that after a myocardial infarction, the muscle, you know, let's say that you have a, a heart attack, right? So the heart is normally beating like this, contracting like this. So when the, the, the heart, uh, when after a heart attack, the, if this area got damaged, you know, you didn't have oxygen, it's not longer moving. So the, the muscle, we call it the, the, the thickness of the muscle that you lost is, is gone. It won't right. be able to be recovered. Um, so the material we recently developed is able apparently to, to help the heart to heal mm -hmm. uh, because the heart is too busy beating. That's the problem. So, you know, uh, your skin can regenerate, but the problem with the heart is that it's too busy doing all the work of pumping the blood to right. keep us alive. Uh, so that's a really exciting material that uh, we hope to translate uh, shortly to the clinic. Okay. When I say shortly to the clinic, yeah. just be aware that it's going to be at least four to seven years from now, but that's relatively short. And uh, we are also working on a, on a printable, a handheld 3D printer for, you know, uh, you know really uh, printing uh, structures on the heart so we can actually help the heart to, to keep in place after a myocardial infarction to, to, to reduce the deformation. Uh, after the myocardial infarction, and uh, we work also in, in cornea. But I would say that the 3D printing and the first material are really exciting. And mm -hmm. most of the students who are coming, they want to actually work on those. On two. 3D printing, yeah. right? So, yeah. 3D printing. Are we so when we talk about 3D printing here, are we talking about the 3D printer in this in the surgical room, 3D printing on the heart, or will this be um, a 3D printed material that will be pre? printed before going into surgery no, how we, would that we, work out so we want to do it in the OR so we in want to OR. give actually okay. something portable to the surgeon so the surgeon will be able to do it you know on, on site so very so custom very very person. custom yeah so okay. we, we in the lab we do everything so from the design the pumps and everything we do including the biolinks yeah. okay so do you think that that would change uh, the dynamic of an OR because you would need a new person in there who would have to operate this machine or the scientist who uh, developed the material? So that would, yeah. um, you would have a whole new, whole new, uh, <laughs> whole new setup in there. Uh, that's a good question. I think that that I uh, will let my colleagues, the surgeons, to answer. But uh, right. but yeah. So yeah. But as technology is evolving, we need to be able to adapt to the technology. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first step is that, you know, like, uh, but again, I mean, the limitation of 3D printing this day, bioprinting, is that it's normally done, you know, not directly on the patient. Right. So yes. now we're working on trying to develop this device that it will be portable and the surgeon will be able to use to print right. on site. So right. And excited. I think surgeons are normally <laughs> open to suggestions and help. They're commonly part of, you know, we're trying to get them into um, a project right off the bat so we know that once something does get translated exactly. to the clinic, it'll be, um, you know, designed properly. <laughs> so that's really, um, that's really great. Well, thank you so much for joining us thank here today. So and um, that's all for this interview. We will be back shortly with Dr. Eric Saronin, who is also a researcher here at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute. Uh, so thank you for tuning in and we will get back to you shortly. Beats Radio, scientists interviewing scientists. Canada is a worldwide leader in science and innovation. However, our communities need to be more connected to current scientific research in order to drive the future of scientific innovation. So what steps can we take to more actively engage and connect our community with scientists and vice versa? 
Innovation and discovery are at the core of the current efforts of our government, but science sometimes gets slightly complicated to understand. At Beats Radio, we will tackle this by having young scientists and early career researchers interviewing scientists and innovators. By dissecting science in simple terms, this will allow our community to better understand the importance of science for our country. Stay tuned for the launch of our first radio podcast streamed from an actual lab. Hey there, my name is David Cortez. Tissues like lungs, skin, heart, and cornea are prone to be damaged. Modern medicine has a large repertory of great therapeutic solutions for treating damaged organs. However, the toolbox of solutions is still limited. We are exploring how the properties of materials can be manipulated at the nanoscale for generating novel materials for organ repair and their preclinical test and validation. We are also working on developing a library of functional nanomaterials for tissue repair, in the hope other researchers will have access to our discoveries. Learn more about this and other exciting research areas in www.bitsresearch.com. Hey there, my name is David Cortez. Doctors and healthcare providers have access to a number of therapies and therapeutics to treat diseases. Ultimately, the patient outcome will depend on this. However, the repertory of therapeutics is still limited. Improving the therapeutic outcomes involves multidisciplinary teams for developing rational and functional solutions. In the field of biomaterials, such improvements will directly translate in improving the patient's life quality. Learn more about this and other exciting research areas in www.bitsresearch.com. I was born in 1976. I grew up here. This building is who I am. The patients Doctors, nurses, and staff, they truly are my family. Some thought I wouldn't make it, but great leaders fought for me. They believed that I could change Ottawa, Canada, even the world. And they were right. By the time I was 30, I'd saved thousands of lives, was recognized internationally, and had collaborated with over 40 countries. I've performed over 500 heart transplants, discovered the world's first genetic risk factor for heart disease, combined care, research, and education in one place, leading the way for innovation in heart disease throughout Canada and the world. I'm always thinking of the future and learning from the past. But through all this, I couldn't have done it. Not without the people. The people here have taught me that through great loss can come great triumph. And that fear is never as strong as hope. I can't stop until there's a cure. And I will spend every second of my life trying to save yours. Some might say I've lived a thousand lives, but I feel I'm just getting started.
This is quite a day. Quite a day for healthcare in Ottawa. Doctors, nurses, volunteers, board members. It takes a community to build a place like this. We will be able to perform more procedures reducing weightless in open heart surgery as well as in non-surgical procedures. The total of complex surgical and non-surgical interventions here will be over 12,000 a year. Welcome to our home and your home from the bottom of our heart. Thank you very much. I think it's enlightened. It's an amazing. Out of this world. <laughs> Magnificent. Beautiful. Incredible. Uh, amazing. Yeah. It's like going to the Star Trek age because the technology here and all this is compared to before. So imagine how patients are going to feel when they're being treated here. Uh, we're very pleased to have this new facility. It's going to be in a tremendous improvement for our patients. Uh, currently, they're in an area that's quite crowded. Uh, there's not a lot of space for their families when they come to visit. And uh, it's, certainly, uh, it's certainly older. So now we're in this bright new facility. There's all sorts of space for them. Um, and there's places for families. There's a terrace for, pa for patients who have to stay a long time. So it's going to be a huge improvement um, for the staff, but more importantly for all of the patients. There's air everywhere, so there's nothing, uh, and that's very important in windows because people in after surgery, they get disoriented if they can't see outside. So there, there's windows in every place, and that's very, very important. This is a, a moment we are waiting for the last 12 years. I mean, this is a brand new uh, facility which is adjacent to our current facility that, we, uh, that will uh, include all the uh, operating rooms, the, uh, the uh, intensive care beds and uh, which is serving 80% of our patients because most of the things we do at the Heart Institute is uh, very advanced cardiovascular care with open heart surgery, with uh, high-tech uh, high uh, medicine. Dr. Eric Saronin and I'm a scientist and associate professor working here in the Division of Cardiac Surgery at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute. In my lab we're developing biomaterials and regenerative therapies to treat heart disease. One of the materials that we use is made of a protein called collagen which is damaged after a heart attack. We also study how our materials interact with the cells in the heart in order to develop, use this information to develop uh, better therapies down the road. Our hope is that we'll be able to uh, transplant our materials into patients who have suffered a heart attack to repair the damage that has occurred or even to limit the amount of damage that occurs in the first place. This would lead to a quality of life improvement for patients who have suffered a heart attack and also reduce the incidence of heart failure. Beats Radio, scientists interviewing scientists. Canada is a worldwide leader in science and innovation. However, our communities need to be more connected to current scientific research in order to drive the future of scientific innovation. So what steps can we take to more actively engage and connect our community with scientists and vice versa? Innovation and discovery are at the core of the current efforts of our government, but science sometimes gets slightly complicated to understand. At Beats Radio, we will tackle this by having young scientists and early career researchers interviewing scientists and innovators. By dissecting science in simple terms, this will allow our community to better understand the importance of science for our country. Stay tuned for the launch of our first radio podcast streamed from an actual lab.
Uh, so good morning again, everyone. Uh, welcome back to Beats Research Radio. My name is Hal Yarnitz, and I am your host for today. Uh, now I'm excited to introduce to you our second guest, Dr. Eric Sronin, who is um, an established scientist and researcher here at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute in the Division of Cardiac Surgery. And he's also the director of the Bioengineering and Therapeutic Solutions Lab here at the Heart Institute. So thank you, Eric, for joining us. Thanks for having me. So could you please tell us about uh, a little bit about your background, how you became a scientist, and uh, you know why you're here today with us? Um, so I grew up here in Ottawa. I uh, did my high school at uh, Colonel By High School. And there I knew early on that I wanted to pursue a career related to science and more specifically in the life sciences. Uh, so when I graduated there, I went and earned my undergraduate degree uh, in biology studying at the University of Ottawa. Uh, I then obtained my PhD in cellular and molecular medicine, also from the University of Ottawa. Uh, I was then recruited uh, to the Heart Institute uh, here in Ottawa, where I pursued postdoctoral uh, studies in the Division of Cardiac Surgery under the supervision of Dr. Mark Ruel, who's a cardiac surgeon and chief of the division uh, here now. I was then recruited as a principal investigator uh, in the Division of Cardiac Surgery in 2005. So that's how I got my start uh, here at the Heart Institute. Wow. Yeah. Very cool. So all around, uh, you're very familiar with Ottawa, and Ottawa is probably one of the best places to be for uh, cardiac uh, surgery and cardiac um, research, so very impressive. Um, would you be able to tell us a little bit about the, uh, your research on cardiac tissue repair, uh, specifically your CIHR and NSERC grant that I think uh, you're applying for right now? Uh, actually, we, we just obtained that funding well, last year. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so I can tell you a little bit about how we, what research we were doing that led to uh, to that funding and, and then sort of what we intend to do uh, in the future uh, work of, those, of this project. So uh, my lab and research is primarily focused on developing regenerative therapies for treating cardiac disease uh, and injury. So when a patient suffers a heart attack, uh, the body has very limited ability to repair the damage that is done. And depending on the severity of the heart attack and the response of the patient to mm -hmm. the conventional treatments, there's a chance that the condition of the heart can get worse. And so uh, if, if this happens, patients can develop heart failure. And for this, there's really no treatment available other than heart transplantation. And there, it, it, there's often a long uh, wait, uh, wait list for getting a uh, suitable heart. Uh, so the research that we're doing is trying to uh, limit the number of patients that may actually progress to heart failure. So we're doing this with uh, the use of biomaterials. Uh, and so these materials can provide a scaffold to support cells and repair. Uh, and then we, are, we can use these materials by themselves or with uh, stem cells or repair cells that we would deliver with the material to the heart to try to replace the, the cells that are lost after a heart attack. Um, so these cells that are lost after a heart attack, are they a specific type or uh, would you be able to explain to our um, viewers what um, exactly is missing there? Right, so most people are aware after a heart attack, or the heart attack is caused by blockage of an artery or right. several arteries feeding uh, the, the heart muscle. Mm -hmm. And so when this happens, the, the cells in the heart no longer have a, access to oxygen or nutrients and you get massive cell death mm -hmm. uh, and so you lose all of the cells in the affected area including the, the cardiomyocytes which are the muscle cells, mm -hmm. uh, the blood vessels, uh, the uh, cells that are called fibroblasts, they're responsible for the maintaining the, sca the natural scaffold of the heart so to speak. They also uh, are the ones that uh, deposit the scar that 
a right. patient will develop after having a heart attack. Okay. And so the, the scar, it's beneficial because it prevents you from getting a hole in your heart okay. so you don't bleed out. Very important. <laughs> yes, uh, but at the same time, that scar doesn't have the ability to contract like the rest of the heart does. Okay. Uh, so you lose, uh, your heart loses strength and your, it loses its ability to properly pump blood throughout your body. Um, and so depending on the size of the scar, uh, smaller scars, uh, typically these patients can uh, benefit from the treatments that are available and uh, will not develop heart failure. Instead, yes. they can then uh, go on to lead, lead relatively uh, r normal lives. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, like I said before, we're trying to develop a treatment for those patients that don't respond to right. the, the therapies that are currently available uh, so that uh, perhaps we can regenerate some of the, some the tissue that's okay. lost. Awesome. So would you be able to tell us uh, a little bit more about uh, that project? Is there you know, other parts of it that uh, our listeners would find interesting? Yeah, I can describe a little bit the, the biomaterials that we're currently testing okay. for treating the, the infarcted heart. Um, so a biomaterial is essentially uh, a material that's designed for interaction with uh, living tissue uh, and most often uh, for a medical purpose. And materials can be made from synthetic, like uh, plastics, for example, or they can be made from natural components. Our work is uh, focused primarily on using natural components. Okay. Uh, the, each synthetic and natural materials have advantages and disadvantages for both. Uh, we work uh, with the natural materials because uh, they interact better with cells, and so uh, when you ha when you introduce them into the into the heart, then the ce the cells that are in the heart can uh, interact with it, receive the signals that uh, may induce more regeneration or repair. Right. Um, so these natural biomaterials, these are uh, biomaterials that our body would produce naturally or and we find in biology in general? <laughs> that's right. So okay. the, the heart, the main component of the heart's scaffold, the natural scaffold that it has is collagen. Right. And that is the material that we're using in our therapies. Uh, so type 1 collagen is the, the main collagen found in the heart, and then the second most abundant is type 3 collagen. So okay. the, our materials are made using both types of, of these collagens. Um, that's not to say that you have to use uh, the proteins or uh, polysaccharides, which are, are sugar-related molecules. Uh, you don't have to use the ones that are naturally found in the tissue that you're treating. Uh, however, we chose to use that because it is the material that the cells are most uh, used to in of, right. interacting with. But other, other materials have been used, uh, for example, chitosan, which is found in the seashell, in the cr shells of crustaceans. Okay. That is a, a material that is commonly used uh, in biomedical right. applications as well. It's not found in humans, right. but it's still a natural a material natural. that cells interact with. Okay. Um, so we, we take the collagen and we use uh, chemistry to uh, make a scaffold with it. Uh, okay. that it's called a hydrogel, so it uh, contains a lot of water, same as the, the body does. Um, and our material is injectable, so we can keep it in a syringe uh, in liquid form, and then once it, it gets injected into the body and reaches body temperature, it forms the hydrogel, so it, it forms like the, a jello-like material okay. once it's injected. And the advantage also of the fact that, that we're injecting it as a liquid is that it can fill the space that's available right. to it. So in the injured tissue, there's a lot of dead space, uh, the material can be injected and, and fill, fill, fill up it. that space. So an injectable material, that would be ideal so that it's a less invasive surgery as well. Is that one of the benefits to this injectable technology? Definitely, yes. Okay. Uh, so eventually what we hope is that you could do a minimally invasive procedure whereby right. you would just create a small opening. It's 
through where you could then insert a catheter and guide it to the heart for injection mm. into the heart rather than having a open, open chest surgery. surgery. Yes. yes. Wow. Very interesting. Uh, so I, I can also tell you a little bit about how the material works to yes, definitely. To, to I think heal our, the heart. The listeners would be interested. So, uh, as I said, when we inject it, it it's as a liquid, and so we've done imaging uh, studies where we label the, the material that we're injecting so that we can visualize it uh, with a PET imaging uh, system, which is similar to what patients undergo here when they're looking for uh, blood perfusion in the heart or mm -hmm. uh, looking at the viability of the heart. So we can use the same uh, instruments that are used to image patient hearts to image our matrix that is okay. injected into the heart. Uh, and we can then see that when we deliver it, it actually does spread and fill the uh, the space, the there, space yeah. that's in the injured part of the heart. Uh, so we know that it's going where we want it to go, and mm -hmm. uh, we can see that it's staying in the area that we've injected it, rather wow. than just being pumped out, because okay. the heart is pumping as we deliver it, and so we can see that it, it, it does stick uh, right. inside the heart. Wow. So when you're using that... Um, uh, that machine, I guess, would you be working with uh, a surgeon or is that something that you guys do in the um, lab on your own? It depends on the project. Sometimes we have uh, surgeons involved in, in the uh, animal work that we're conducting. Mm -hmm. um, particularly in the past, we did do one large animal study and for that we did uh, it, get the help of uh, residents in the cardiac surgery okay. program to come and uh, perform those uh, studies for us. Um, and But a lot of the work is also done by graduate students who mm -hmm. are uh, studying the different uh, therapies that we're developing. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, and so also with that PET imaging system, mm -hmm. uh, we have done the same tests that are performed on patients looking at blood perfusion and viability of the myocardium, so of the, the, the area of the heart that we're trying to repair. So we can, we've shown that when we inject our material into the heart, uh, within days and weeks later, you can see that uh, blood flow has returned to the injured part of the heart. Okay. Uh, as opposed wow. to untreated animals where the, the blood flow remains quite limited. Mm -hmm. uh, we also see increased viability, so uh, indicating that less cells are dying after the treatment has been delivered. Uh, okay. So again, wow. we're, we're preserving uh, tissue, because after a heart attack, if it's been a severe heart attack, tissue continues to die uh, right. up to even months that, and even yeah. a year later, you can still have dying tissue okay. as a result of that event. Um, so what, our, what we've shown with the PET imaging studies is that we prevent that ongoing cell death. Okay. Uh, wow. So, so we, ca we can't stop the initial cell loss that occurs right at the right. time of heart attack, but we are able to limit how much more damage occurs right. over time. Okay, wow, very interesting. So that massive cell death at, uh, right at the beginning, there's a very difficult, it's very difficult to get, um, you know, a therapy in there straight away because it's a very short period of time. That's so by right. the time the patient would come to the hospital, that those cells would have been dead for a little while now. Yes, okay, millions, so of cell, yeah, millions of cells will die within the first 20 minutes. Okay. So yes, it's very difficult to uh, envision a, a treatment that would be able to prevent, prevent that, that when, when it does take right. time to get to the hospital before a doctor even But sees your it. biomaterial prevents the ongoing death, so that yes. is very impressive. So um, if a patient were to come into the hospital uh, having just had a heart attack, how long um, you know, would, would your biomaterial be injected kind of right away, or would that person have to wait for a surgery like this maybe? Yeah, so right now it's in the development stage, so we're mm -hmm. still trying to figure that out. So right. we believe that it may be different ma types of materials that will be needed for treating patients at different times right. after their infarction event. Um, okay. So 
the ones that we're aiming to test in patients first will be uh, at, at about a week after the infarct event has okay. occurred, um, simply because we think that is the, the population that could possibly benefit most, most uh, right. from it at this point. Mm -hmm. That's not to say that you know treating earlier isn't something we're, we're trying to do as well, but I think as a first target to show the it, to show that our treatment is working in humans, that is the mm -hmm. target population. Right. Um, and so, like I said, a, a lot of patients with the treatments currently available can recover and, and lead normal lives. So we're targeting those patients That's that maybe a week population. later could be identified as having not responded properly. Right. And so we'll see, can our treatment improve their okay. outcome? Definitely. So would you say that uh, this population of people that don't respond to the um, the treatments that are available right now is that uh, you know if you were able to give us a maybe a estimate on a percentage would it be a very high percentage of people low percentage it's a fairly low percentage of people okay. uh, I don't know the exact numbers I but I, it might be five to ten percent okay. of patients uh, may not respond appropriately and and develop go on to develop heart failure but those that do go on to develop heart failure heart failure I believe it's has, has a 50% mortality within the first five years within okay. five years of right of being diagnosed with progression to heart failure mm -hmm. uh, so so the out outlook for those patients is not is. very good mm -hmm. uh, so if we could prevent those people that. from yes. reaching that stage Definitely. then then we would keep a lot of people uh, alive. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's great. Um, wow so would you say that um, with I guess from being in like, at the Ottawa Heart Institute here and being so close to the um, the hospital but also being at the research institute what do you think that we need to further mobilize our technologies that we're creating in the lab from to mobilize them into the clinic faster because um, your biomaterial that would be that would be probably uh, is it being injected into humans yet or no not yet we We've finished the small animal studies for okay. our materials. Uh, I mean, I shouldn't say finished. We've done a sufficient amount that now we are starting the plan to do to the progress. large animal studies. Okay. And that, those are the studies that are needed to uh, provide Health Canada with the information they need to decide if uh, we can proceed to clinical trials. Okay. So that's the next stage, and we're, we're hoping to start that relatively soon uh, to get a, a, a large animal model uh, study underway mm -hmm. uh, and then fill out the, the paperwork for Health right. Canada. And so maybe three to five years from now, we can do a pilot study in, okay. in, in, in humans. In humans, yeah. okay. So uh, I guess start of the project to a prospective end of the project. Would you be able to give us a time timeline there? Like how long would you say it's going to take to get to the end? <laughs> um, I don't think it'll end. <laughs> ever end. Yeah, that's yeah. like most research. It, you 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 may hit milestones, but right. everything can always be a little advancing. Better. Yeah. Yeah, and and you learn along the way that. There may be different approaches that could be could be better than what you've right. tried so far, or uh, you can combine different approaches uh, mm -hmm. to have a, a more synergistic. Uh, right. So you started outcome. this project in which year? Um, well, the idea of injecting collagen materials into the heart, uh, we we started that in about two thousand five. Two thousand and five. Yes. Okay. So. And when we started that work, we were using animal-based products, mm -hmm. um, and we still had to develop the material, the the concept of the material. Right. Uh, and we had originally started working with the material, not thinking that it itself would be a therapy, but rather to improve the results of stem mm -hmm. cell therapy, because right. that had already been ongoing for a number of years and was showing some promise, but one of the main issues was that 
you'd inject stem cells into the heart and because of the pumping action, mm -hmm. you'd lose almost all of them within hours to a few days and you'd have almost nothing left. Uh, yeah. so, so we thought okay, if we could deliver the cells in a jello or a gel, right. that then they would stay in the heart and because you have more of them there, you'd get a better uh, therapeutic response. Right. And so that's what our initial goal was and it, it did improve the results right. of cell therapy but at the same time one of the controls you need to use for that is material only mm -hmm. and we saw Definitely. that the material by itself was also giving a positive result on the function of the heart wow. and so then from that point we started developing materials also to be used as standalone therapies okay. uh, again wow. all with animal products mm -hmm. and so in the last few years we're now switching to use recombinant human proteins so that we have something that's ready for the clinic and that's right. also part of the Health Canada application is to show that our materials are not going to cause any immune response immune when they're response, injected right. and for that we need the, the human form of the, right. the protein in our materials. So those are good <coughs> ways to you know kind of try and advance what you're doing a little bit quicker into the clinic are mm. there any others that you can think of or something mm. that uh, you might have you know, thought of after the fact, and like, oh, I next the next time I'm going to try this, or you know, I'm going to make this collaboration earlier on, or you know, to try and get the process going from, I guess, you know, 14 years now to you know, try and get that down <laughs> a mm -hmm. little. Um, well, I don't, I can't think of something that we would necessarily have to do quicker, mm -hmm. uh, but I think. One of the advantages that we have here at the Heart Institute is that the clinic is, is here. <laughs> right beside the the, exactly. the, the basic research science that's, uh, that, that's going on. So there is interaction between clinicians and scientists mm -hmm. uh, and, and discussion of how to address some of the problems in the clinic. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that that's something that would benefit the translation of research ideas and to, to benefit patients is a, more cooperation between clinicians and scientists. Right. Uh, that's definitely been a lot better in the last, I don't know, decade or so, mm -hmm. or, or maybe longer. Uh, but I think it's there's that could still be improved. That okay. If there's more face-to-face -face time between clinicians and scientists, explanation of the clinical problem and, and vice versa explanation of right. what is being done in the lab and there may be more common ground yeah, uh, than, sure. than you realize. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think that would definitely help with uh, translation of, right. of therapies. Very, very cool. So you've spoken to us a lot about your passions, about science <coughs> and uh, cardiac uh, surgery, but could you tell us a little bit about yourself and you know what you do outside of the lab and you know uh, what you're doing on the weekends and not at the Heart Institute? Um, I enjoy cross-country skiing, um, okay. so obviously I can't do that all year round, <laughs> yes. uh, but so in in the off season I, uh, I do running as well. Okay. Uh, I spend a lot of time uh, with family, with my kids, um, and I also uh, write and record music. Oh so wow, very cool. What, what type of instruments do you? Uh, well, I play guitar, I can play a little bit of piano. Okay, uh, very cool. I, so, and I, I just joined a band a little while ago, so okay, that's been fun. Wow, very, very cool. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Sronin, for joining us here at Beats Radio. Um, again, I would like to thank um, the University of Ottawa Heart Institute, eLife, the Canadian Biomaterial Society, Ottawa Student Chapter, as well as the Beats Research, research team that are supporting our endeavor here at Beats Research uh, Radio. So thanks again. We'll be back uh, next week uh, at the same time. So we we'll hope to see you all again soon. Thank you very much. Beats Radio, scientists interviewing scientists. Canada is a worldwide leader in science and innovation. However, our communities need to be more connected to current scientific research in order to drive the future of scientific innovation. So what steps can we take to more actively engage and connect our community with scientists and vice versa? 
Innovation and discovery are at the core of the current efforts of our government, but science sometimes gets slightly complicated to understand. At Beats Radio, we will tackle this by having young scientists and early career researchers interviewing scientists and innovators. By dissecting science in simple terms, this will allow our community to better understand the importance of science for our country. Stay tuned for the launch of our first radio podcast streamed from an actual lab.